Hello and welcome to Competition in the Age of Ecosystems, a two-day virtual event exploring the new realities of ecosystem-based competition. I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers50 and director of the Business Ecosystem Alliance. This event is a partnership between the Business Ecosystem Alliance, OutThinker, Thinkers50 and the Higher Management Institute. We're delighted that people from more than 50 countries have signed up from Ethiopia to El Salvador, Australia to Finland. Thank you for joining us if you are with us live or watching a recording. A Mandarin translation is available for all of the sessions. In addition to the live sessions, there are a number of fantastic pre-recorded sessions which are also now available. These feature some great discussions on the impact of ecosystems in a number of business sectors, as well as leading thinkers and practitioners such as Rita McGrath, Tiffany Bova, and Kyan Krippendorf. We especially thank Kyan and his team at OutThinker for their collaboration. As always, please let us know where you are joining from and ask questions in the chat or question box at any time during the session. We really appreciate your insights and input. And now to our next session. We are delighted to be joined by Ron Adner. Ron is a professor at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College, an author of The Wide Lens and his latest book, Winning the Right Game. Ron argues that the basis of competition is changing. Rivalry is shifting from well-defined industries to broader ecosystems, automobiles to mobility platforms, banking to FinTech, television broadcasting to video streaming. Your competitors are coming from new directions and pursuing different goals from those of your familiar rivals. In this world, succeeding with the old rules can mean losing the new game. Ron, welcome. Well, Perhaps sure, it's great to be with you. A, a starting point would be talking about the genesis of winning the right game. What, what, what were the origins of, of, of the book? Um, so, as you said, I wrote a book in 2012 called The Wide Lens, which was an effort to understand how does the way we innovate, the way we think about innovation need to change when we realize that we're no longer creating value on our own. And instead we need to orchestrate partners into this you know, word that we call ecosystems that we can discuss in a little bit. But, but so the first step in this was to revisit how we think about innovation. What that led to was a realization that if the way in which companies are innovating itself has changed, right, this reliance on partners in order to deliver not your product, but these more composed value propositions, then there's a very important implication for how we have to rethink competition. And that's where this book, Winning the Right Game, originates. This notion that in this world of ecosystems, the way we compete, the way we win itself needs to be reconceptualized. Um, and if I you know, if, 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 I, if you think about that title, right, winning the right game, is it's, it's playing off a little bit. I mean, you and I are old enough to remember when GE was, you know, one of the leading companies in the world. And when Jack Welch was regarded as one of the greatest CEOs of the 20th century. And Welch wrote this really great, really influential book called Winning. And in some ways, that was enough. That was really good advice. You want to be a GE, you need to be number one or number two in your industry. And the way you did that was through lower cost, higher quality, et cetera. Um, the title of this book is, is, is suggestive of the fact that that is no longer sufficient advice, right? Because what that industry that you're supposed to be number one or number two in is so much murkier, right? Winning today means choosing, there are multiple games being played on that same board by different players. And so you need to understand what those other games are and you need to make sure that you're picking the right, the game that is right, both for your market and for you, right? Because kind of the, 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 the counter side of that coin is that winning the wrong game can look a lot like losing. So I've moved on quite a long way from Jack Welsh. I, I speak as the author of Leadership the Jack Welsh Way, <laughs> which, uh, which didn't trouble the, the bestseller list, but was uh, an in interesting exercise for me. The, uh, but we've almost moved from the Jack Welsh perspective of, of winning was kind of binary, it whereas binary. now it's multifaceted. It, you know, it, it, was, it, wasn't, it, it was binary and it was also linear in the sense that you could measure your progress against everybody else. Whereas today, there really are multiple dimensions on the board. 
And the reason that, you know, it's interesting when wide lens came out, one of the challenges was to get people to realize that the way they're, th that the old ways of thinking about innovation were, were really no longer suitable to the day. Winning the right game, everybody is already at the place where they know that the old ways of thinking about competition are not serving them in today's environment, right? Whether you're looking at encroachment by startups into your space, whether you're looking at encroachment by like, these new ecosystem giants into your space, you know, everyone's worried about Amazon. Everybody's working on, worried about Google, right? How does the company that serves ads online suddenly find itself as a mover and shaker in the automotive industry, right? These boundaries are breaking down and suddenly the way you need to respond both offense and defense needs to be revisited. So winning itself is more nuanced. Definitively. And, it, and, and winning, the, the nature of winning, and that applies to startups and incumbent companies. Yeah. And essentially, you know, so one, of the, one of my big ahas in this, uh, in this book was, so, all right, we have this word ecosystem that everybody is using now all the time. Obviously, the you know organizing theme for this session, um, you know, and I would say ninety-five percent of the time when somebody uses the word ecosystem in a business conversation, you can take out that word ecosystem, you can put in the word mishmash, and no meaning would be lost, right? And that, by the way, that in itself is interesting because this is now it's getting to be as overused a word as as disruption, right? Which also lost its meaning long ago. But there's, a, there's an indicator there. The people, people are using this word a lot because they get a sense that there's stuff outside of them, of their own organizations that they need to worry about. And the fact that you can use mishmash instead of ecosystem means that most of the time people don't have much more than that. That intuition that things are changing. So for me, the starting point of thinking about ecosystems is clarity on what we mean by that and what we don't. Right? So the way that I define an ecosystem right, this is kind of the anchor point for this book, is that an ecosystem is defined by the structure through which partners interact to deliver a value proposition to an end consumer. And there's a lot of uh, important nuance in that definition that I think if we can understand suddenly a lot of strategic issues become less confusing. The first is that an ecosystem is anchored in a value proposition, right? That is, it's not anchored in a company. So my way of thinking is you shouldn't be talking about an Apple ecosystem or a Google ecosystem, right? Instead, it's a value proposition, which is handheld devices or health or mobile payments. Those are different value propositions where a company like Apple may be involved in and they may bring similar elements to, right? Phone, app store. But the structure of interaction among the partners required to deliver mobile payments is very different from the structure of interactions required to deliver mobile health. That's what makes them two separate ecosystems. And it's this notion of structure that for me is at the heart of taking the idea of ecosystem away from buzzword land in making it something actionable, right? And if I continue for another moment, the, the thing that makes ecosystem strategy relevant is not that you have a lot of partners. It's not that you have a lot of interdependence because you can look at any industry today, you look at the car industry 30 years ago, there was massive interdependence. You're talking about incredibly complex supply chains, right? So it's not about, oh, partners are new. It's not that reliance is new. Ecosystems matter when the relationships among those partners are being redrawn, right? So if you look at implications in self-driving cars, if you look at implications in electric vehicles, what makes it easier, harder to talk about a car industry today and requires, say, a mobility ecosystem is because relationships among players are changing. And it's in that context that we need new tools and new perspectives. So from what you're saying then, Ron, ecosystems have always been there. Ecosystems. I mean, they existed, yeah, they existed in the car industry historically. And in fact, they were very interwoven and all, all, all related to each other. But we didn't think of them as ecosystems. 
So actually, I, I describe this, by the way, anybody viewing this, you can you can read the first chapter on my website. It's full, the entire chapter is posted. And even there, I, I start talking about this notion of the ecosystem cycle, which is ecosystems are either in the foreground or the background. Okay, 100, 120 years ago, we had an automotive ecosystem where people were trying to figure out, okay, we're going to put an engine on a chassis. Who's going to build the engine? Who's going to build the chassis? Who's going to take care of, of providing the fuel? What's going to happen when it breaks down? Those were relationships that needed to be negotiated. We were in an ecosystem setting then. And then as those relationships stabilized, hardened into the activities that we recognize, oh, you're the car companies, you're the garages, you're the fuel company, you pave the roads, you provide insurance, we, those ecosystems mature into industry relations. And then for a long period, we can move back to our, you know, our classic strategy tools of industry analysis, which is, okay, you're a car company, you know, Porter's five forces tell you, here's the boundary, how do you compete within it? And then what happens on occasion, and we're seeing this a lot in this current moment of history, is that those industry relationships begin to disintegrate and we move back into a world where they need to be reconfigured and renegotiated. And that's when we need to talk about ecosystems again. So where, does this, where, where, where does this leave Michael Porter and the five forces? Oh, well, it, everything Porter said is right and appropriate for industry settings. It is becoming less appropriate, pretty obviously so, in settings where the boundary of the industry itself is being redrawn and reconfigured. Right. So I think if, if you think about the five forces, it's a very powerful framework for thinking about value capture in a setting where everyone understands the value creation and how it's supposed to be created. Moving into this ecosystem world, suddenly in the four is, even if we have an image of a value proposition, how we create it in collaboration with others, that falls outside of, look, that falls out of Porter's frameworks, that falls outside of Christensen's frameworks, right? I draw this really strong distinction between what I talk about is classic disruption, technology disruption, and ecosystem disruption, right? If you think about classic disruption, it was a new way of doing the same thing, right? Southwest Airlines was a disruptor to the airline industry because the way they organized their activities was different. Mini mills were different from integrated mills, right? All those classic, super powerful, super correct examples. Correct. However, if you step back, Newcore Steel is still selling steel by the ton. Southwest Airlines is still selling airline tickets, right? Whereas if you think about changes, right? Mini clinic, right? It's still, you know, pay for, it's fee for service healthcare. Whereas if you think about the kinds of innovations, when we talk about disruption today, much more of it is, ah, Uber, it's not really a car. It's not really a taxi. It's a different kind of service. The boundaries that define the old industries are breaking down. And that's why we need, you know, that's why we need this new thinking. And, you know, to do modesty, I think that's the core of this book is that contribution. So, so the language of disruption is out of kilter with the new reality. Well, again, it's not, it, it's, it is no longer sufficient to capture the current reality, right? And I, I think, and I, and I say this with, with the utmost, uh, you know, respect and appreciation for that prior work. It's not that it's wrong. It's that it was built for a world of industries. By the way, much of the economy today remains in this industry setting. And so part of what a strategist, what a leader needs today is it's not throw out the old toolkit and put in the new toolkit. It's you need a new toolkit and you need to be thoughtful about where you apply which, right? And, and well. how, how aware are people in organizations that they need this new toolkit, do you think? I think they, they are aware that their old toolkit is getting harder and harder to use. I don't think that that naturally leads to, oh, there must be a different toolkit. Um, and I, I think, you know, look, quite frankly, most conversations about ecosystems, certainly in the public forum, border on bullshit in some way or another, right? It's like, oh, things are different, things are different, but there's no actual guidance that comes from it. 
Um, and partly it's, look, it's really hard to develop new tools. Now, again, I, I would refer, you know, anyone listening to this, that's what these two books are about. Every chapter is a tool. Um, and each one of these basically is coming from a starting point that says, ah, something really is different, right? And, you know, we were talking that, so the, the kickoff example in Winning the Right Game is the story that every single person listening to this conversation has heard at least a hundred times, which is the story of Kodak. And within two pages, you will see why everything you've ever been told about Kodak turns out to be hundred percent wrong, right? So the, the, the Kodak is emblematic of what we get wrong in this context when we apply the old tools to our new challenges, right? In that, so the story of Kodak that's usually told, that's hammered into executives to scare them is, what happens when you're not sufficiently aggressive about innovation, when your culture is too staid and you're not enough of a risk taker is you're like Kodak where you're succeeding in one world, analog photography. Maybe you even invent the new world of digital photography, but you can't get your act together and then you die because of laziness and inertia. And that's how we explain the Kodak story, right? They're, kind of the classic disruption story of, oh, they disrespected the new technology and then it got good enough and better and they died. That's the story that you've been told. That story is 100% wrong. It turns out that, okay, Kodak struggled to get its act together on digital photography through the 90s, but starting in 2000, they went through this massive transformation. They saw all the money that companies like HP were making in digital printing Right, think about how much money you're paying for that ink. And they said, you know what? We can do that too. And Kodak transformed itself into a leading player in digital printing, right? They became the number one seller of digital cameras in America. They became, uh, if, you know, even today, if you go to uh, retail outlets like you know, CVS and Walgreens, you will see Kodak printers in the corner of the store. Right, Kodak got into those stores by pushing out Fuji. Right? How do you push out your number one rival from your number one account? It's not by being fat and lazy, it's by being totally awesome. Okay, Kodak becomes this very strong competitor in inkjet printing. The thing that kills Kodak, it's not that they don't die by the way, but it's that what didn't kill them was not taking action. Right? This is exactly the point of, you know, what does it mean to win the wrong game? It means you become a leading digital printing company when digital printing itself goes poof. Digital printing gets disrupted by digital viewing, right? So you can make the best photo printer in the world, but if everyone's looking at photos on a screen, it doesn't really matter. And that's what, that's what kills Kodak. And any manager who's being told the Kodak story that says, oh, take bigger risks, is, is, is being told something that is so unproductive in this current world. Right, because the point is not, can you transform? It's, can you drive productive transformation? And seeing this different kind of threat, this different kind of disruption, again, requires different tools. It requires us to be able to look outside of technology and industry boundaries to see how those boundaries collapse. And that's, you know, so that's the starting point for this new strategy journey. Yeah, a few comments have come in as you've been speaking, Ron. Uh, Richard Dazzler says, disrupt yourself. Kodak has the patent on first digital camera. So I think that's emphasizing your point that it wasn't, wasn't through laziness or lack of innovation. Well, you know, so they invented the world's the, the first digital camera. And then usually what we, you know, what, what they get beat up on in a classroom environment, but then they didn't do enough with it because they were, you know, they, they were so caught up in their analog profits. Um, and, and the point is yeah, they, they struggle with that, but overcoming that struggle is not the answer to how you don't die, right? So there's a very, there's a very good case to be, to, to be made about, oh, Kodak shows you how difficult change management is. But my point is that the notion of you need to get, to be able to change is such an incomplete point of guidance because the bigger question is, what do you wanna change into, right? In some ways, Kodak would have been much better off pursuing the script that people say, which is they didn't even bother with analog, they'd still be dead, but at least they wouldn't have wasted all that money. And so this is, you know, this is the, the, the story of the age. You know, there's again, 
you know, so I, I, I lead the book off with this quote from Mark Twain, right? What gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so, right? And, and we fall into these kinds of traps in this world of structural transition, right? Which is what we mean by ecosystems. When we apply an industry logic to draw a conclusion or draw an inference, ah, you know, they died, it must be because they didn't change. Whereas really it's no, it's because they didn't change into the right thing. Um, you know, large companies are forever being beat up and beating themselves up on, oh, we're not investing enough in innovation. That's nonsense. If you look at how much money is spent slash wasted in large companies on all kinds of new innovations, um, the budget is enormous. That's different from saying that they're getting a good return on that investment, but blaming it on a lack of creativity is focusing on a Either the wrong problem and possibly a problem that's not really a problem. It's something else. It's how do you commit to those kinds of innovations? Um, and I would say, you know, along those lines, innovating in an ecosystem and driving ecosystem innovation requires a, again, it's a different rule book that, um, you know, read these books. That's what it's about. Um, and it's, the, if, you know, the, the reason you hear me getting excited about it is because it's painful to watch really good people working really hard in ways that are predictably flawed. There's a better way. Isn't the difference that it's not a rule book, it's a playbook? It's a, a, a playbook. A, yeah, yes. a, rule, a rule book suggests some rigidity, whereas a playbook suggests things are change, yeah. changing constantly. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're well, it's, you're, you're, you're right in the correction. It's a set of, it is a, con, it is a consistent set of principles. So it's not that everything is constantly changing. There are a set uh, body of principles that are robust to any kind of ecosystem uh, effort. The, you know, the, the specifics of how you apply them vary by not just context, but also company. But the principles are, um, are to me at least, you know, pretty clear. And that's that's you know that's what I lay here. There's ideas around adoption chain, co-innovation, minimum viable ecosystem, staged expansion, this the idea of the of the ecosystem cycle, um, ecosystem offense and defense, or operate according to certain principles. That anytime any any instance that you see where people are successful, you can see them echoed, and where people are not successful, there are a hundred other ways to screw up. But often it's because of a misapplication or an ignorance of the set of principles. Well, the speed of change is always a, an interesting issue. And Eugenio de Silva Neto says, although ecosystems have existed for a long time, what's different is the speed at which digital transformation is impacting them in all, in all industries. Is, it, is, is, is that true? I think then all ages, doesn't every age say, oh, the speed of change is, uh, I mean, Kodak could have said that at the time, couldn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a great comment. And look, yeah, look, the Romans put down road networks and those were, you know, new versions of interconnected. So of interconnectedness. So yeah, ecosystems existed for a long time. I used to start my MBA class off with a case on Western Union and their decision about the telephone and the telegraph. And part of the reason that I would do that was to make this point that you just said, which is, you know what? You were around in 1880, so many things were changing. Electricity, plastic, flight, just like in that period of time, so many things were changing. And it's and so the point I used to make is, hey, don't get too excited. You know, we've seen this before. I don't teach that case anymore because I don't think that statement is accurate. I think in the last 10, 15 years, what we are seeing is, it's not that ecosystems have not been around, it's that, Efforts at creating new ecosystems have become one much easier to muster because of what's happened with technology and connectivity. That's one. But two, what is really unusual is the number of these efforts that are taking place within single organizations simultaneously. So that, again, if you think about a company like you know Ford or GM today, the number of new innovative efforts that they're launching that are not products that they control, but rather are propositions that require coordination with others 
that's the that's where the real step change has been in the last 10 years. And of course, it's not just what's trying what, what you're trying to do within your company. It's what these other people in other parts of the space that are starting showing up in your space. And that's why I think it, it's a legitimate, it is, it, it is a legitimate claim to say today is a strategically much more complex environment than it has ever been. Not because we've never seen this kind of change, but because you've never seen this kind of frequency and intensity of change simultaneously. There's a question from Alex Pezjak. Do you think one value proposition with a customer in the center is enough or two value propositions working towards a co-created purpose? Um, can, can, interesting. Can, can you unpick that? It's an interesting question. Um, so the, one successful value proposition is enough. I would say yes. Now it depends on you know how big an or how big the value proposition is, how big an organization you're building towards it, um, right? So presumably enough there means you know to have a you know profitable, sustainably profitable business. Um, what I would say is there's there, there are two different ways to think about that notion of the value proposition, right? There's the initial value proposition that can be extended. That's one way of growing a value proposition. And then you can think, or alternatively, you can think about adding a second proposition, which is different, which puts you in a different ecosystem, right? I think if we you know, go back to the case of Apple, right? Apple is basically making its money off of one value proposition, okay? It, the, the value proposition that revived Apple was access, you know, devices that let you access data on the go. Right, you know, that's the iPod to the iPhone to the iPad to the Apple Watch. Right, that's all within this sweep of devices that let you access data. And around it, there's an App Store, etc. But you know, where does make Apple make all its money is in that part. Um, and what's interesting is if you think about that sweep, you know, according to this, you know, what I find is, you know, the productive definition of an ecosystem. All of that is happening within a single ecosystem because the structure of collaboration is constant. You're adding new players, but no one's trying to move seats. Whereas if you look at where Apple has actually been massively disappointed, Apple Health, Apple Video, Apple Publishing, um, Apple and the Smart Home, uh, we can, you know, the, the, the list goes on. Uh, those are different ecosystems in that even you know, Apple, Apple Pay, Apple Mobile Payments are trivial compared to what they're supposed to be. And even though, you know, every bank and every retailer has an app for the iPhone, right? They were unwilling to participate in Apple Pay, which required a different structure of collaboration to deliver this different value proposition. Um, so Apple in some ways demonstrates you can make enough money in the one value proposition of the one ecosystem to cover a lot of sin in the others. But it also shows the danger of not understanding where it is that you're extending one ecosystem versus crossing into another. This is what I this is what I talk about in chapter five is the ecosystem trap, and this is what happens when you define an ecosystem not around the value proposition, but rather rather around the firm. And by the way, I would say the vast majority of the world defines an ecosystem, not an ecosystem. Right? They think about the firm specific version rather than the structured proposition version. So the world is full of ecosystems. Indeed. But when, what we need is ecosystems. Go, uh, Paul Hobcraft is, is watching and says you'd like to know more about the new, the new tool, toolkit. And what, what are the most exciting elements of the new toolkit from your, your perspective? Um, well, that, that sounds like an invitation. So the, all right, so I, I'll walk you through winning the right game. Like Wide Lens has its own set of tools. Um, so winning the right game starts with the notion of a value architecture, which is a different way to parse out the world and kind of for me was a like the discovery of a new level of analysis that sits between a value proposition and the activities that are undertaken by organizations, either your organization or, or your ecosystem partners. And in some ways it, it creates this approach that's like design thinking, not from the customer side to the value proposition, but from the firm side to the value proposition. And it lays out 
a, a way of thinking about the elements around which the ecosystem gets organized. The reason I came up with that was because, so, you know, I had, I had this Kodak insight long ago. That's not interesting. I mean, maybe it's like, it's good cocktail party conversation. What matters though, is how do you replicate that insight in new settings? And this value architecture is the tool that I use to identify disruption that goes across these boundaries. Because absent that, all we see is disruption that happens within the existing boundaries, the classic disruption. Once we see that, we see a second new relationship, a second tool, which is what I talk about is value inversion. So one of the interesting things that happens in these ecosystems, and this is like, this is putting structure on things everybody was talking about, right? So, you know, we've had this notion of frenemies and cooperation again, since the nineties, um, but we don't know what to do with it, right? It doesn't tell us who's going to show up and what to do. So the second idea I'll share with you is that historically we've had two kinds of economic relationships. We've had people that you look at and as they got better, you were worse off. Okay, that's what we call a rival. And if the way they did the work was different from you, you would call them a substitute. But there's this uniform relationship that the better they are, the worse you are, the worse off you are. Then we have this other group of people that we call complementers. And those are folks who, as they get better, you're better off. That's a uniformly positive relationship. Once we start thinking in terms of value architecture, we see that there's an interesting possibility. And it's, it's, it's an interesting analog to, you know, so classic disruption, what you worried about were substitutes that started off as irrelevant and then became good enough. Ecosystem disruption, what you worry about is partners that start off as being helpful, right? They're complementers, but then they get to a point where they become too good. And beyond that point, further progress on their part begins to undermine your value proposition, right? So, you know, if you think about, so the Kodak story where that shows up is in the beginning, having better and better screens on cameras and phones was good for the people trying to make money printing photos because a better screen meant you had more confidence in the picture you're gonna take, better, better cameras lead to better pictures, better pictures are more likely to be printed. And every time they print, you make money from paper and ink better, better, better. And then the screen gets essentially too good, right? Apple comes up with their ret retinal display. And at this point, suddenly, as it improves, there's less and less reason to print. And this thing that had been a compliment begins to show up as a substitute, right? There's, you know, this whole world of precision agriculture is exactly the same kind of story, right? Which is the relationship between the people making equipment and the people selling inputs, you know, seeds and fertilizer, well, better tractors means you can, you know, you can, you can, you can till more acreage. So that's good. Now, as these tractors are getting better and better and more precise about where they're able to place seeds, where they're able to, to, to place fertilizer, where there's less waste because of the tractor, well, suddenly, you know, less waste from the farmer's perspective is less volume from the seller's perspective. And here again, we see this inversion. This is right. This is a new dynamic that you know I don't think has actually been described previously in the literature, but it's certainly being experienced, right? And so what you know what you want is you know how do I how do I begin to analyze this? And again, I, you know, I wrote the book for a reason, and it's to help people reason through these kinds of issues. And from this starting point, then you can realize ah, there are really interesting implications for what it means to disrupt on the offense side what it means to defend when someone is trying to move in this direction, right? What it means for how we think about the timing of disruption. And the thing that ecosystems raise that weren't really relevant in a world of industries is the question of roles, because you know where you were was kind of assumed by your position in the value chain, but also role in terms of a leader and follower, right? That when, when particularly when large companies talk about, well, anything, they always envision themselves as leaders, right? I'm a leader in my industry. Of course, I'm going to be a leader everywhere else. In ecosystems, the notion of leadership means something completely different than the notion of leadership in an industry, right? In an industry, leadership is an outcome, uh, number one market share, number one revenue, number one whatever. 
And in an industry, you should always strive to be the leader because even if you miss, you're better off for the effort, okay? I moved from number five to number three. In an ecosystem, leadership is something, is, is, is not an outcome, it's a role, right? The ecosystem leader is the organization that gets the other partners into this structure. And what that means is that, first of all, the desire to be a leader means I need to have a credible reason to think that other people will choose to follow me, right? That is, I need to give them a reason to agree to not be the leader. And the reason that choosing leadership needs to be approached with much more care in ecosystems is because in an ecosystem, if you can't bring the system together, you get nothing, right? You don't get any credit for the effort. You just have a mess to clean up. And so every company in a successful ecosystem is successful by definition. Followers can do incredibly well in an ecosystem in a successful ecosystem. Leaders in an unsuccessful ecosystem get nothing. And so what this presents is a different higher, what I call a, a hierarchy of winners that again needs to be inserted into the strategy conversation, right? So it's not that the old view of, oh, I wanna be the biggest in the industry was wrong in an industry context. It's that in this new context where the game is creating value through these new configurations, you'd better not be using that old toolkit because it's gonna blind you to the real dynamics that you need to manage. And, it, you know, that, and the fact that you're blind to them doesn't mean they don't exist. Let's go, go to some questions. Martin uh, Roygerkamp uh, asked about uh, where does this leave open innovation? Open innovation was one of the, one of the ideas of um, Procter & Gamble, wasn't it, in, in 2003? all the talk about open innovation, but it really kind of makes you redundant if you're practicing ecosystem thinking. Well, you know, I think open, again, these ideas that we have, they still matter. We just need to be careful about where we want to apply them and be careful about what it is we think we're solving with, right? So open innovation, which, you know, Hank Jesbro has done such a beautiful job of, of capturing and characterizing, um, is I think what it applies to is your creativity engine. Like how do you bring more ideas in from the outside and how do you harness more of your ideas? If you can't manage them inside your organization, how do you let them thrive on, you know, elsewhere? So both on the input side and the output side. Um, that is a great set of questions. It doesn't address alignment. It doesn't address how do you get other people to participate in constructing this ecosystem. And by the way, the risk is that many, right, so you know, probably half the cases in my books are about failure, right? The other half are about success. But I'd, I'd argue, you know, we, we learn certain things from success, but we learn things from failure that can't possibly be understood otherwise. And part of what's interesting about failure, by the way, is not just what causes it, but as per this Kodak story, how it's understood or misunderstood. And I think there's a lot of misattribution of the cause of failure to a failure of innovation, a failure of ideation, when uh, a substantial amount of the time, even though we blame the idea when the initiative doesn't work out, the real problem was a failure in the construction of the ecosystem around what, would, what was genuinely a great idea. Um, I can give you an example, but I don't know, you, you give me guidance of how, how deep we want to get into that. Well, let's move on to a couple, couple more questions so we don't, don't leave anybody out wrong. Um, Anastasia uh, asks, well, suggests that a company like Apple, that one of the secrets of its success or the roots of its success was the personality, mindset and leadership of Steve Jobs. I wonder to what extent do companies and organizations reach this meteoric success due to the specific philosophy and management style of this kind of, kind of leader? And... I, I guess what she's kind of guessing at really is the role of leadership within these sort of ecosystems. It's such a great question. Um, and it, it, it's an exciting question for me because, um, so chapter six of the book is about leadership at the individual level, which as a strategy person was in some ways the least, I'll either say the least comfortable or the biggest leap 
for me to take. Um, you know, usually strategy people don't have a ton to say about leadership, not because we don't think it's important, but because, you know, you don't have much to say. Yeah, get, you know, if you, if you have a choice, get a better leader. The big aha for me here was that ecosystems require not better leaders, but a different leadership mindset than industries do. And I, I contrast the difference between an execution mindset and an alignment mindset. And these are, you know, it's possible that the same person can have, can switch from one mode to the other, but these pull leaders in two very different directions. Um, an execution mindset, which is what we usually celebrate, is a leader who, who is able to pull their organization together and pull the organization and its mission and put it above everything else. Okay, a my organization first, selfless leader, level five, spectacular. That works really well in an industry where the pieces are aligned and what you're trying to do is, is execute with efficiency and capture the most value that you can. If you're in an ecosystem setting, however, where the challenge is to convince other partners to work with you, a my company first type of attitude is a hard, it's a hard way to build a coalition, right? I mean, hey, we just went through this whole America first movement. That was, you know, that, that was not a particularly great way to build new ecosystems. An alignment mindset forces a different set of trade-offs than an execution mindset. And it's not that one is better than the other, it's that one is more appropriate to a setting than the other. And this is this link between where you are in the ecosystem cycle and the kind of leadership mindset that you need to have at the top of the organization. Um, and the, well, so that's, so, so, so that's, that's the beginning of the answer. I, mean, I can recite the entire chapter to you, but for me, it was, it, was, it was a really exciting discovery because what that means is that whether you're you know, at the top of the organization you know, or at the board selecting leaders, it means that the way you, you should be thinking about leaders is different, but also critically, look, most of us are not at the top of the organization, right? The organization is a triangle. The vast majority of people are, are living in the middle. And there's always this question of, all right, so what does that actually mean for me before I'm running the show? And the really strong implication is that this is how you need to select the leaders that you want to follow within the organization. This is how you need to select the projects that you want to commit to within the organization, because if they're not aligned in the way that we're talking about, then, they're, then you need to be really clear about why you're participating, right? So like your personal strategy for your own growth, development, career trajectory can be informed by this, even if you're not you know, at the, you know, in, in the C-suite making big calls. Can you tell us more, more, you mentioned earlier, Ron, minimal, minimal viable ecosystem. Can you tell, tell us more, more about that? Because that just sounds like a really interesting idea. Um, yeah, well, thank you. It's, um, so the, it's an idea I started exploring in Wide Lens and then kind of re, re, reconceptualized in, in, in the context of competition, right? So Wide Lens was about innovation, we see it show up in a different way in the context of competition. So um, all right, everybody is probably familiar with this concept of a minimum viable product, right? Which is a, you know, it's a tool for essentially it's customer discovery, right? Your minimum viable product, design thinking, A-B testing, all this idea of experimenting to figure out what it is that you're supposed to be doing, right? You're trying to discover what the real value proposition is. That is not what we're talking about. Okay, what we're talking about is how do you bring partners into the configuration that will deliver that value proposition? Right, so this is getting to the question of how do you construct an ecosystem? And the short version of the answer is, how do you construct an, an ecosystem? One, not all alone. Two, not all at once. So the question is, all right, well, how do you know? So between where you are and where you want to get to, how do you fill in that space? And the first step is to create, to identify what I call a minimum viable ecosystem, right? Your minimum viable ecosystem, it's the smallest 
collaboration that you can create, not that will deliver that value proposition. That's not gonna happen until you have everybody in the room, but that you can get some initial traction. And the purpose of this minimum viable ecosystem is to allow you to take a journey that I talk about as staged expansion. And that's the strategy for the sequence through which you're going to add partners. Why do you add partner B before partner C? And it's not because you don't want C from day one, it's because you realize C won't join until you have A and B in place, but it'll be a lot easier to get C to join after you have A and B in place. And so what this is uh, fighting against directly is this notion that you think of an ecosystem and then you try to launch the ecosystem. That is the formula for failure, right? That is, you, you hear a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of confusion between the notion of a platform and the notion of an ecosystem, right? And, and, and people you know, have this idea of, oh, I wanna be a platform because then you know, other people are jumping up and down around what I'm doing and every time they land, I get some money. That sounds like making money in my sleep. What a dream. I wish I could have that app store. And what I think the vast majority of conversations miss is that almost no one starts life as a platform, right? Everyone starts life with nothing and they build an ecosystem. And some of those ecosystems can end up having a platform element. Some of them may never need to or want to have a platform, but the fight is against the notion of, I'm trying to get, do everything all at once. Um, and just because I have the, the image of the final thing in my mind, I'm ready to go. You know, quite the opposite. The image of the final thing is the most generic thing in the world. Right? Think about every everything that's exciting in the world today: personalized medicine, self-driving cars, um, you know, crypto solutions, um, whatever it is you want. You know, smart home. The vision is the same. The question of who's going to win and lose is not. You know, did they understand what the smart home should do? It's can they bring those pieces together? Like one of, one of the interesting cases in the book is how Amazon gets to the lead position in the smart home um, and totally, totally offsets any the expected success of, of, of Apple, Google, and Microsoft in that space. And it's not because those other companies didn't envision a smart home. It's because those other companies didn't manage to construct an ecosystem. It's a very interesting story there that, again, I invite people to, to dig into. But that's the, the MVE links into ecosystem construction. Who, who does this well? Who, who is winning, winning the game? Who's set up to win the game these days? Um, well, so it's really easy to point to a company like Amazon, um, who, who I think is doing it really, really well. By the way, the other usual suspects, you know, Apple, Google, I don't think are doing well. I think they are doing very, very well in their home ecosystems and then have done have mightily struggled to make similar impacts in other ecosystems. I think the more interesting part of the answer is separate from the giants. Uh, so, okay, chapter two of the book is ecosystem defense, which is probably more relevant to, to, to most listeners. Um, doing this well doesn't just mean taking over the world. Doing this well means when somebody moves into your space, you can react and you can succeed and even thrive. So one of my favorite examples from the book is how Wayfair, seller of online furniture, um, which starts, starts life as a disruptor. That's, that's important actually. Every, every, every case in this book that I look at is a company that either started fully digital or transitioned into digital. And then the question is, well, and then what do you need to do strategically? So Wayfair starts off as this picture book disruptor. Um, right, they're going to outcompete the, the the local furniture market because they have greater selection and you know better logistics. They're doing fine, and then Amazon says, "You know what? The one category we haven't really focused on yet is furniture. That's our new priority." They say this in 2017. And the question is, well, how is Wayfair still in business? How is it that they're worth ten times more today than when that announcement was made? Because clearly, they're not going to outcompete Amazon on selection. And you know, they have warehouses, Amazon has their own airline. How do you succeed in that setting? And the answer is, well, goes back to this idea of the value architecture is you rethink your value architecture and then you reconfigure partner relationships 
in order to sustain your position. So Wayfair creates this whole new direction and redefines what their, uh, the, the, the core part of their architecture is not about transaction and selection, but rather about uh, deliberation, right? How do you get people to choose to be, to be able to make the commitment to furniture, which turns out to be this really big hurdle separate from, you know, can you afford the couches? How do I decide which of these 50 couches is the one I want in my home, right? Different example, Tom Tom, right? How is Tom Tom still alive today, given that their core business of GPS devices was disrupted by the smartphone and their backup business of geodata gets disrupted when Google says, hey, Google map data, we're gonna give it away for free, right? TomTom Tom plays again, this really interesting ecosystem defense game that embraces the notion of an ecosystem is a coalition. How to create a coalition that helps me sustain the attack of this giant. Um, you know, basically it's, you know, who else, not in my industry, but in my sphere, would also prefer that Google not run the world. Um, and, you know, they give themselves the, the, the breathing room that, you know, allows them to invest in, you know, in, 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 in you know, new high performance maps that, you know, might become quite valuable and critical in the world of self-driving cars. So success here is not just the usual giants. It's, um, it's available to anybody who is thinking about new combinations. And in some ways, then the question is like, well, who, who is this not relevant for? And the answer is, I think this is, this is critical for everyone today. Uh, Paul Hobcraft echoes your point. He says, are not Apple, Google, and Microsoft all struggling with broader ecosystems? Yeah, no. It, it, and by the way, I think that should give people a lot of solace and hope, right? That don't confuse the fact that they make so much money in their home ecosystem with a prediction that that means they're going to be successful everywhere else, yeah. right? There is plenty of room to play for smart followers, smart defenders, and smart attackers. Right, but certainly I would say playing by the old rules, you're a sitting duck. Uh, interesting point from A.D. No Donovan. Um, earlier today, one of the speakers, uh, Penilla Isberg from AstraZeneca, uh, noted in her experience that internally at AstraZeneca, the cultural issues of creating an ecosystem created more problems than the technical issues. What, what do you think incumbent firms should do to create a culture that embraces ecosystems? Aside, uh, from, aside from a leadership mindset, mind well, shift. okay, it's 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 a great question, um, and there there are two parts to my reaction to it. The first is internal ecosystems um, are often trickier than external ecosystems. I one hundred percent agree with that. The second, which may be a little more controversial, is that I think that we have we have been attributing to this word culture. It's like the catch-all for the things we don't understand. And so we say, oh, it's a cultural problem. Culture is a real thing. I think that at least as big a failure within most organizations today is that strategy is a hollowed out function that most people won't say that out loud. And so what we end up doing is attributing failures that come from an incoherent strategy to an unsuccessful culture. And that is inherently unfair because you're blaming your people for not knowing what to do when you haven't given sufficient guidance as to what needs to be done. And this again, takes us full circle to the crisis of strategy today is that the strategic tools that are used in 99.9% .9 of organizations are inadequate to today's task, not because they are the wrong tools, it's because today's task is so different from the task of, look, when did the, the core strategy tools get built? Porter stuff came out in 1980. He's solving problems that he saw in the 70s. Clay stuff came out in the early 90s. He's solving cutting edge problems from the 1980s. Those are amazing contributions, but the world in 22 is different. And so I, I, what I don't want to do is, is, is blame culture for problems that are strategy problems because it, it lets strategy off the hook and blames people where, by the way, you know, certainly they can be doing a better job as well, but you, you want to allocate blame to the right places. And have the, the last two years of the pandemic changed things? Um, 
Well, yes and no. Um, I think the, certainly in terms of, of internal ecosystems, um, the pandemic has created much greater uh, possibilities for new configurations. Um, so that's a positive. The negative is it's not clear that it's made anybody more strategic. And again, if you don't have the right strategy, just moving chairs around doesn't do anything. Again, we're back to this winning the wrong game, you know, Kodak's massive effort to recreate itself, but it recreated itself in the wrong way. So there's a, there's a great potential, but potential on its own doesn't manifest as outcome. There's a broader question from Johan Wong. Uh, what ecosystem challenges and opportunities do you see at the intersections of ESG, CSR, SDGs as they relate to climate change or, uh, or, or other existential crises? Are, is understanding of ecosystems crucial to getting anywhere in solving these issues? It seems to me that the sense of perspective and the broader mindset you talked about is, is essential. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, that's actually what the, the afterword of the book is, is about this exactly which is this notion of ecosystem disruption is not just a, a private sector story. Um, I mean, if you, you know, start with COVID, right? COVID is a great example of an ecosystem disruption. It is something that in the old world, it's a virus. It's supposed to be solved within the realm of healthcare. Its impact broke through all these other boundaries, right? COVID is something that, you know, impacts international relations, trade, Every, every function of government was impacted by COVID. And so the response to something like that can't just be within healthcare, right? The, the same is true of, you know, these other problems. You know, we used to think about environmental concerns used to be something that in the U.S. would be an EPA type problem, okay? There's a smokestack at a factory and it's putting out the wrong smoke. That's a classic in the box problem. Today, global warming is, it's not just that smokestack, it's not just acid rain, it's sea levels rising, it's you know the countryside on fire, that requires collaboration in a totally different way, in a di totally different mode than in the past. And so, yeah, that's a long way of saying that it's critical, it's even more critical in the public and the social sector to get this right than in the private sector because the problems that they've been allocated to solve are just so, so big, and by the way, the resources you have, they have to apply are so much more, not necessarily limited, but more constrained. So them having this kind of strategy is even more, more critical. And again, I'll, you know, the, the, that discussion is, it's, it's on my webpage. You can go to ronadner.com. You know, it's, it's in, it's in the, the, the excerpt of the book. Um, yeah, this is, this is critical stuff beyond just, you know, like a keynote speech. This is, if we can't get this right, we're, as organizations and as you know, broader citizens of the world, um, we will we will feel the impact. So where, where does your your work go next, Ron? I know the the book Winning the Right Game hasn't been out for out for that long, but I know there's a there's, a, there's always a gap between you finishing it and publication. So where, where, where's the research going next? So it's interesting, kind of where. So Winning the Right Game is kind of a continuation of the of of, of some of the ideas at the end of wide lens, right? That's why they're different books. Where it's taken me now is more thinking about kind of this closing discussion about internal ecosystems, interacting with external ecosystems, and what that means to the goal of change management. And I had some interesting, you know, some interesting ideas, interesting experience with clients, organizations that you can really, you can apply this kind of logic and, and drive a, again, more coherence and more coherence lead to better results than you know the old toolkit. Um, so that's that's one that that I think that's the the, the key directions I'm pushing on right now. Are you, are you optimistic, Ron? Do you, do you think that organizations are taking these ideas on board and re are really changing shape? Um, I'm optimistic. I think organizations uh, look. I think organizations will take these ideas on board. I think there's a um, if you think about you know, the quality movement, if you think about what it took to get the world to understand how to run efficient supply chains, that was a 10, 15 year journey. Um, by the way, if you think about the challenge of understanding ecosystems, which is you know, a supply chain was really, you knew who the buyer was, you knew who the supplier was. The question was, how can you interrelate? Ecosystems are you know, 
dimensionally more complicated because there's a whole discussion about, well, who's sitting where and what are they doing? So it makes sense that it's gonna take more time. Um, at the same time, I think that there's more and more clarity and more organizations that this is the challenge they need to solve. And so I'm optimistic because, okay, one, I think like there's, now there's, there's a toolkit that didn't exist. So there's some fundamental way of making progress on it, right? That was like the last 10 years of work that went into this book. But two, I think there's more and more recognition of the problem. And, you know, that's the first step to a solution. Right? You can't solve a problem that you don't see. More organizations are seeing this and, you know, hopefully through, you know, more conversations like this, we'll have people will shift into this mode. And, you know, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about both uh, about the creativity applied to the prop to, to the problem, the energy applied to the problem. Yeah, I think we're remember we're not in none of the, we, we've been living in this world. Right. It's not seeing the problem doesn't create the problem. It just gives an opportunity to solve it. And it, maybe, maybe that's the kind of the core of my optimism. The, um, uh, one, somebody's commented, this is a high, high substance dialogue. And I think that sums up uh, Ron, Ron's book, high, high substance. But I think what comes across talk, talking, Ron, is that this is important. That if, if we're going to shape competition, if competition is going to be better understood and organizations are going to respond to the, the changing reality, they've got to embrace these ideas. So there's a lot to play for. Yeah. So I would encourage you to buy Winning the, winning, win, winning the Right Game. Uh, Ron has pointed out his website, ronadner.com. It's got loads of material there, which gives you a taster of the book. Uh, no, nothing is a substitute for buying your own personal copy. Obviously, we would encourage you to do that. Thanks very much, Ron, for joining us today. Really great clarity and really powerful logic as Jim Moore is watching the session as, as, as pointed out and we really appreciate your your support and contribution so thank oh, you to Ron Adner. Thank you Stuart it's a great pleasure to, to, to spend time with you really great conversation.